Okay. Well, um, again, welcome everyone to the Teaching and Learning Conference. Thank you so much for uh, bearing with me as I adjusted. I think I have, I'm counting like six different windows on my screen right now as we are navigating this afternoon. Um, my name is Mark Rincon and I am your presenter for this afternoon. Our title of our presentation is Discipline, Deepening Disciplinary Uses of Metacognitive, Metacognitive Conversation. And thank you. First, I just want to say thank you so much for being here this afternoon. And uh, we will dive in. Like I mentioned, my name is Mark Rincon. I work here at the Nevada Department of Education. Um, we you may have heard from this morning, our office is now the Office of Teaching and Learning. And I serve in the role of K-12 English Language Arts. So what does that mean? I really am here to provide professional learning guidance to teachers, uh, school districts, and charter schools across the state. So, I would like to dive in and look at some data. Uh, what you are looking at right now is the some NATE reading scores from 2022. I just want to just take a look at that for a moment. And I just want to share with you in 2022, the average reading score at both fourth and eighth grade decreased by three points compared to the scores in 2019. At fourth grade, the average reading score was lower than all previous assessment years going back to 2005 and was not significantly different in comparison to the year 1992. At eighth grade, you'll see on that chart as well. The average reading score was lower compared to all previous assessment years going back to 1998 and was not significantly different compared to 1992. In 2022, fourth and eighth grade reading scores decline for most states compared to back in 2019. And as you can see on that graph, right there, the scores do show that decrease for both fourth grade and eighth grade um, NAEP reading scores. And you're probably wondering, well, what does this have to do with this presentation? So we're gonna get into that. So, we hear a lot of information about early literacy, but we don't hear a lot of information when it comes to our middle and high school students. As you saw in that data for fourth and, and eighth grade students, um, about two thirds of US high school students are unable to read and comprehend complex academic materials and they are unable to think critically when sometimes when it comes to text, synthesize information from multiple sources or communicate clearly what they have learned. Only a small majority of eighth and 12th graders read at an advanced level. When you think about it, many high need students have been demoralized by years of academic failure and to not see themselves as readers or capable learners. As we all have, you maybe have worked with adolescents, um, it's hard because sometimes when we are working with our elementary students, it's getting them to get excited about literacy, but then there's something that happens and it, there's something that happens in that middle in that middle school years. It's when they're transitioning to adolescence and reading is not as fun as it used to be, or they're just not engaged with reading because 
we now have other platforms such as YouTube, TikTok, and other social media platforms that are taking the attention of our adolescents. So when we think about this, our achievement gaps are stubbornly persistent along racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic lines. By some estimates, half of the incoming ninth graders in a typical high school in an urban area read two or three years below grade level. Now, if you think about this, this even co is compounded more greatly with COVID-19 and the learning loss that has occurred these past few years. So thinking about that, we talked about the persistence achievement gaps when it comes to literacy in middle and high school. Like I mentioned, it's definitely seen with divided between racial, ethnic, socioeconomic lines, high poverty schools. And also with that, many of these students are reading below grade level. And what do we, what are the tools and strategies that we can utilize when it comes to working with students at the middle and high school? Because <clears throat> the most important factor when we think about it is when they are in terms of graduating, we want them to be college and career ready and be able to go into skill sets, uh, get a job, go into a career. And if they don't have that literacy background or the skill set to understand how to read a technical manual or how to read a basic text on chemistry, or if they're going into radiology, how to interpret and read different types of information that's being presented. So let's look at the literacy ceiling. And so the literacy ceiling, as we like to look at it, is there's a limiting potential. And that what that means is that students are facing reading and comprehension difficulties, and they encounter a, a literacy ceiling that constrains their academic and their real world achievements. So once they hit that ceiling, if they can't, if they cannot overcome that, then they're gonna be facing some detrimental impacts later on. And then when we think about that further, the classroom and beyond, the ceiling affects not only their performance in the classroom, but also their lives outside of school. And so, this has a great impact on all of us as teachers uh, in, in the classroom, working with middle and high school students. Some of our personal challenges that we have faced is that we face our students' limitations in their ability to understand some of the information that's being provided. And that in turn is reflected on us sometimes. We take it personally because as we all have been, we always want our students to be successful. And then we face their limitations. And we think that, is it us that's delivering effective instruction? So when we think about that impact on us as educators, there's some alternative approaches. So when students struggle to access knowledge and information in text, you know, we as educators need to seek alternative methods to help students grasp that content. So how do we do that? Uh, the answer is that we're gonna talk about this afternoon is using disciplinary literacy. And what is disciplinary literacy? Well. Disciplinary literacy focuses on the aspects of reading and writing specific to each discipline, academic discipline, really. This means that students learn to read, write, think, and listen in ways that are appropriate for the discipline. So if we want to think about that, 
a little further, let's dive in and think about reading proficiency and how it varies with situational experience. So when we think about that, that knowledge of proficiency with literacy, it involves that social context influence. You know, uh, literacy practices are influenced by the social purposes they serve. In addition to that, there's varied practices. You know, we have different social situations that teach distinct literacy practices tailored to specific activities. For example, so when we're thinking about reading mathematical proofs in algebra, that's complete, we approach that technique in reading mathematical proofs completely different from reading poet, poetic metaphors. Or if you are taking a course on uh, anatomy, human anatomy at, you, you know, as an undergraduate, you're learning about the different anatomical diagrams and versus if you were studying, studying to become a paralegal, it's different because you are reading different types of texts. You are approaching those texts differently. And we all use different strategies when it comes to looking at these specific texts. So we all bring unique experiences as students. And when we get into that college level, you know, literacy experiences vary among all of us. You know, we are sometimes proficient in one type. You know, there might be, we all might be more proficient at reading technical manuals compared to one that doesn't understand technical manuals or someone that's more, you know, more comfortable reading poems than someone that is compared to reading a, nothing that is similar to poetic uh, expressions. So, as I said, you know, these examples and differences and proficiency vary across different types of texts and disciplines. So why does disciplinary literacy matter for student success? So disciplinary literacy really focuses, like I mentioned, on the aspects of reading and writing specific to each discipline. This means that students learn to really read, write, and think, and listen, like I mentioned, ways that are appropriate for understanding a text when it comes to civics, when it comes to understanding a text on chemistry, calculus, um, understanding your a graphic novel. Um, it really helps students to understand the specialized ways of thinking and communicating. It also gives them knowledge and information in that specific discipline. And they can really transfer these skills when they are going to college or if they're preparing for a vocational career, they can bring in these skill sets from disciplinary literacy and help them be successful beyond after years of going through training or undergraduate school. So <clears throat> when we want to look at disciplinary literacy strategies to support transactions, it's really important for students to, uh, this is really important for students because it helps them understand the specialized ways of thinking, communicating in each discipline, like I mentioned. It also gains access, knowledge, and information to that discipline. So, for example, in social studies, disciplinary literacy strategies can really help students read, write, and think like social scientists. For example, interactive read-alouds. We can provide strategies for students where the teacher reads aloud a text to a student and then engages them in discussion about that text using disciplinary literacy strategies. And so 
really these disciplinary literacy strategies um, provided by different topics such as annotate, anno annotating, synthesizing, um, these strategies can really help students understand the specialized ways of thinking and communicating. And it really gives access to knowledge and information on different topics. And as educators, when we think about our secondary students, we want them to have those skills that are needed to be successful when it comes to secondary education, if it's after their post-graduation, what does that look like for them? What is their career trajectory looking like? Is it military? Is it either going in, like I mentioned, vocation, or is it going into higher education? So this diagram is a, looks at increasing specialization of literacy. And so this pyramid really illustrates the development of literacy. And so at the base, it represents highly generalized basic skills that entail all reading tasks. So those basic generalizable basic skills include decoding skills, print and literacy conventions, recognition of high frequency of words, basic punctuation, et cetera. Now, most of our students master these primarily in primary grades. And even those who struggle tend to master them before high school entry, sometimes. As students progress, more sophisticated skills develop. And so that's where intermediate literacy comes in. These skills are not as widely applicable to different texts and reading situations, but neither are they linked to particularly disciplinary specializations. So they include decoding, multisyllabic words, less common punctuation, such as split quotes, knowing more vocabulary, including words not common in oral language, developing the cognitive endurance to maintain that attention to extended discourse. And using these procedures such as rereading, they gain access to more complex forms of tax organization and begin to use author purpose as a tool for a critical response. And so most students learn these by the end of middle school, but many schoolers, as we have seen, struggle with some of these skill sets. In high school, some students even begin to master more specialized reading routines, language uses, but these routines, though powerful, tend to become constrained in their applicability to most reading tasks. The constraints on the generalizability of literacy skills for more advanced readers symbolized here at the top of the pyramid by the narrowing of the pyramid is imposed by the increasing disciplinary and technical turn in the nature of our literacy tasks. Because like when you're in high school, you're focusing on more technical terms that are being presented to you in the text. Chemistry, calculus, algebra one, algebra two examples. Although when we think about it, most of our students manage to master basic or even those intermediate literacy skills, they never gain that proficiency with more advanced skills. And when they progress, like I mentioned, after high school into um, higher into the pyramid means learning more sophisticated but less generalizable skills and routines. So let's look at metacognitive conversations 
making thinking visible. So I know I've been talking a lot about these different types of content areas. You know, let's think about that question. How do we read US history books or a biology book or a calculus book or even a text that includes Shakespeare? Now, these are some quotes that I would like to share with you that, um, that I've collected. And I've also, while researching for this presentation, I thought it was interesting to see some of the different perspectives of how students look at reading. And so when we look at this first quote, it's from a, a ninth grader, and they write, they state that, well, it's simple. Reading is saying words you see when you look at the page. So, but when you think about that, yes, I can look at the text on a page, but what happens if I come to a word that I don't know, or if I'm reading a, uh, a passage that is, you know, not making sense to me? The next quote I wanna look at, my sister is a good reader because she can pronounce everything, even if it's hard words or big words, she can pronounce it. So when we think about this one individual, so this one individual thinks that reading is, well, if I can pronounce the words, then I'm an excellent reader. There's more to that as we all know. And the last quote, I think of myself as an average reader. I am pretty good at sounding out my words. It, it just might take me longer than others. And so this one individual is thinking about, you know, those texts that we have all experienced as an un undergraduate, we may have taken a course that we may have had difficulty in. Um, one course for me was chemistry. I had, difficulty understanding the different terminologies of that were that was presented in chemistry. And so I did not have that skill set when it came to at that time to really understand and decipher the different skills that I needed to really interpret the different definitions. Um, I just spent how many of us have spent times just rereading the text and thinking, oh, if I reread it again, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna grasp the material. So I would like to conduct an activity for all of us and I want to do a red light and a green light. And so I'm gonna put a link in the chat and it's to a Jamboard. And on the Jamboard, I want you to think about your personal reading experience and history. What reading experience experiences stand out to you? High, go ahead and share your high points, your low points. Were there times when your reading experience or materials, materials you were reading made you feel like an, an insider, like an outsider? And what supported your literacy development? What discouraged it? Was it, for example, did you have access to the library? I mean, did, your, did you grow up being surrounded by books? Or was there an educator that got you inspired to enjoy reading? Or vice, or opposite, was there, some, was there a subject that turned you off to reading? So I'm gonna drop the link to the Jamboard into the chat. And My apologies. Um, do you see the Jamboard on the screen? If someone could just give me a yes or a no. Yes. 
Thank you so much. So um, for the red light, think about your own, for the red and green light activity, think about your personal reading experience in history. Um, what were your reading experiences that stood out to you? Your high points, your low points? Uh, were there times when your reading experience or materials you were reading made you feel like an insider or an outsider? And then lastly, think about what supported your literacy development. Was it a parent, a sibling, a grandparent, a family member? a teacher, All right, let's thank you so much for all of you that have taken the time to participate in the Jamboard. If it's okay with you, I would like to read out some of these red lights and green lights. And as I'm reading them out loud, uh, I hope that you can see them as well. And, and just listen to some of them or read them well um, while I'm going through some of the some of the post-its. So some of the red lights were reading poorly, organized phrase textbooks is really difficult for me. Uh, another red light was reading philosophy in college was a huge struggle. Another red light was didn't like being told I had to read certain books in high school. Another red light was I still struggle with reading statistics. I don't have a deep enough knowledge of the subject to catch nuances when it's the basis of research studies. Another red light is being forced to listen to books out loud that went too slow. Another red light is teachers insisting we read books that were very outdated and much higher than most kids reading levels. Now I'm gonna read you some green light. <clears throat> I remember going to the library every chance I got. My family read books all the time. Another one is surrounded by books as a kid at home. Another green light is surrounded by books at home and taken to the library. Another green light is I was encouraged to read at an early age. I was read to as a small child and taken to the library. I felt like books hold the keys to anything I wanted to learn. I still read obsessively. Another green light is my parents read to me when I would ask, and we have always had a ton of books in the home. And one more green light I'll read is very fond memories of reading with my parents, when I was young, we would take turns reading. Felt so accomplished after finishing 10,000 page novels. So thank you so much for taking the time to share your personal reflections and when it came to the red lights and green lights on your personal experience in history. And with that, <clears throat> I want you to think about your students and think about their red lights and their green lights. Just take a moment, just take one, one minute to just reflect on one student or uh, you know a few students that come to your mind. Think about their own personal red lights. 
think about some of your students' green lights. I'm sure that you are probably realizing that that is really powerful and impactful when you think about, hmm, when I look at my own students' perspectives, when they look at reading, especially our adolescent students, when it comes to their own journey when it, with reading experiences and history, some of their red lights and also some of their green lights. And so it's really important when we think about our adolescent literacy, when it comes to adolescent literacy, it is a, an important topic that does not get a, a lot of attention. We, get a lo we give a lot of attention to elementary literacy, but when we don't focus on adolescent literacy, and it is, has a great impact when it comes to our students when they are potentially getting ready to exit high school and go into a workforce. Think about the skills that are needed to either take a vocational career or take, go into a two-year college program for nursing, radiology technician, or if it's a repair field, such as um, HVAC, um, auto, auto repair. Literacy makes a huge impact on their, on their reading abilities when it comes to these texts. So here's a photo of, of educators that participated in this activity. We had conducted, we asked some educators to um, write down some of their red lights and write down some of their green lights. And so as you can see, uh, a lot of them are very similar to what you had on your, on the Jamboard. So some of the reds were high school assigned reading, um, math, science, social studies reading. They really didn't know how to approach some of that text. And how many of us still today just despise word problems in math? And it really gave us a lack of relevance and connection when we think about some of these uh, red lights to when it comes to literacy. So let's look at some of the green lights. Well, um, dad encouraged reading, going to the library, forming our own interpretation, inter interpretations and choosing a mode, choice, teacher support, showing how to approach the text. And so I encourage you to really, when you have some time, to really think about your students and maybe participating in this activity with them. Look at what are some of their red lights and some are their green lights and see how that can impact some of their ability to really engage with the text or engage with literacy. So now I want us to think about a strategy on how we can help our students when it comes, especially our adolescents, um, when it comes to literacy. And so uh, I want you to think about this, um, this, this image. And what we're gonna do uh, for the next few minutes is we're gonna do a think aloud. 
And um, this is really an informal think aloud, but I really want you to, um, informal think alouds really put the teacher in the role of helping a reader who must really try to unlock the door to a difficult text. Um, when you think about it with a very limited keys. And so students, on the other hand, may recognize and enjoy their own expertise at reading the particular types of text. Um, but what happens when something stumps them or they hit that roadblock? Um, and I want you to look at this map and think out loud to yourself, um, not knowing anything about this, are you able to make any connections using your background knowledge or experience? Um, think aloud to yourself right now, what, what background knowledge do you bring to understanding this, this image? If some of you can just drop into the chat, what, what background knowledge do you bring in by looking at this image? What do you think this image is depicting? Yes. It's a city bus route and um, definitely it is the um, the area that bus route near the Smith Center and the outlet mall. Uh, definitely, you know, it definitely it's an area that gets congested and has a lot of traffic. And so we bring our knowledge of understanding the geography, our experience driving in the area of understanding and interpreting. And we can bring in these tools when we think about it to understand and decipher the text. And so it's really becoming familiar with public transportation, you know, understanding that how many of us have been stuck behind the bus waiting for it to uh, pull out. So we all bring these experiences. And so it's really important to consider that our students carry with themselves a wealth of proficiencies and they can draw upon their proficiencies to support their reading development. So our students really live in completely structured social worlds that they read with considerable skills. They can interpret our facial expression, our tone of voice, and style of clothing can predict how a peer will behave. They're, and even today with YouTube and TikTok, uh, they are avidly exploring the meaning of song lyrics, movies, and other mass media when you really think about it. So the, the strategy of a think aloud is you can use some of these sentence frames to help your students look at a text and have them start to ha engage in that conversation, such as, I can predict that, I can picture it. A question I have is, this is like, this reminds me of. So this strategy is, can be used in many texts from all different subjects. And so I'm gonna show you an image and I want you to think about these different scaffolding tools that you see right here. And I want you to look at this image and see if you can use some of these scaffolding tools to really help you understand and see what's going on. So take a moment to look at this cartoon and start thinking about what is happening here.
All right. So it says, hey kid, wanna be a super bug? Stick some of this into your, into your genome. Even penicillin won't be able to harm you. The quote at the bottom, it was a shortcut through the hospital kitchens that Albert was first approached by a member of the antibiotic resistance. So what are some strategies that you use to really understand what's going on in this picture? What do you think it's, what do you think it's referring to? Go ahead and type it into the, into the chat. Or if you would like to come off mute, feel free to come off mute. Yes, understanding the vocabulary. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. What kind of strategies from the Think Aloud strategies can you use to help you understand this cartoon graphic? Like what's going on in it? What's, what's happening in the picture? Or what questions might you have? Nice. I like paying attention to the bolded words. Did anyone think, what is that? What is he, um, what's, what's he holding? What's the guy in the trench coat, trench coat holding? Yes, DNA. And what do we, what do we interpret a, a person hiding behind an, uh, you know, in an alley with a trench coat and a and a hat like that? Do, have we seen that before? In just using our past experiences, a shady character, exactly, exactly, yes. So let's look at another image of text. Take a moment, look at the parts and any graphics. Out loud, tell yourself what you do or do not know by looking at this graphic. Are you able to make any connections to your background knowledge or experience? Describe what they are out loud to yourself. Can anyone tell me what's what's this uh, image for? What's it used for? Exactly, it's a fuse box map. It's uh, basically telling you um, what fuses are to be used for the different types of um, items within a vehicle, and so. What, what helped you determine it was a diagram information for a fuse box? Yes, the name, the amperage amount, prior knowledge. Someone mentioned the, the logo for VW. And we also know what's this iconic image of right here that I'm circling. That iconic image is, as we all know, the Volkswagen Bug. Yes, Carrie, exactly. Let's look at this graph. Take a moment, use your prior knowledge to understand what's happening here in this graph. What is it telling us? Yes, COVID testing results, exactly.
what, what do those lines mean? I wonder what, what do those lines, different lines mean? Oh, yes, exactly, different types of tests. Exactly, correlation between the types of tests. And so how do we use our, what experience are we bringing in with this? That experience is exactly our trauma that we've experienced from the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we bring that prior knowledge with us to, and we can utilize that to understand information that's being presented. And so when you think about it, our own students can bring in prior knowledge and we can also give them tools like, for example, using the, those scaffolds for the think aloud to really help them take a pause and slow down and look at the text and understand what is really going on. So when we think about supports for reading, thinking, and talking, we want to look at some of these questions and we're not gonna answer these, but I want you to think about them over the next few, as we are getting ready to close out. How did the text set support building knowledge? How did the order of those texts affect your learning? So think about the cartoon, the fuse information, and then the COVID-19 testing results. And then how can we make the metacognitive conversation about how we are reading, not just what we are reading, a regular routine in our classrooms? And then lastly, how do we introduce and develop the routines of think aloud and talking to the text? So when we think about all of that, it's really coming down to empowering student agency in reading and especially adolescent literacy. Um, it's really that desire for agency. Students of all ages aspire to feel skillful and in control of their activities. They wanna be capable of making decisions and influencing their experiences. It's really, putting students in the driver's seat to tap into this desire. And we as educators, we can give students that opportunity to feel empowered and share their experience. And so we can really look at the reliance on students and it's really having trust in our students as authorities about their own reading experiences. And so think about that red light, green light activity that you completed. And then think, I want you to circle back when it comes to thinking about your students that you thought about. So when it comes to empowering student agency in reading, you know, Teachers can ask about likes and dislikes in reading. We can really inquire about students, you know, their, what's going on outside of school? What are they reading? You know, uh, what is it that they're learning about? You know, or is it, uh, what are they watching on TikTok, social media? And it really helps us understand how students approach their reading. And, we can also use that information to identify challenges that they face. And so, and as we once we have identified those challenges, we can explore the knowledge of the text comprehension. And so this really helps promote growth as readers when you, when you look at incorporating all of this. It fosters a partnership between you as an educator and the student to facilitate our students' growth as readers. And so I only talked about one key aspect of what we 
uh, when it comes to helping our adolescent um, students uh, approach reading uh, the Think Aloud and how we looked at those three different images. So there is many different other instructional strategies that you can incorporate and use with adolescents. And one of these um, opportunities is through reading apprenticeship. And so in reading apprenticeship, we have an opportunity where we are partnering with West Ed and we are offering a, an Essentials One course and that will be offered in person in Southern Nevada. And it will occur on Saturday, October 14th and Sunday, October 15th, um, back to back. And then you'll come back and you will finish the course on Saturday, December 9th. Uh, the time of the course starts at 8.30 a.m. and it goes to 3.30 p.m. Uh, you are to you can earn professional learning hours from NDE. It is free. Um, this course really covers more than I just talked about in one hour. Um, it covers a plethora of instructional strategies that you can use when it comes to disciplinary literacy and really helping your students think metacognitively when it comes to text. And so I hope you have an opportunity to, to check it out. Um, if you would like to participate in it, I'm gonna drop the link to the registration page into the chat. Um, also, we're coming close to the end of our session. So I'm gonna open it up for questions and answers. If you would like to come off mute, ask more questions about the, the opportunity for professional learning. Um, if you have not, please take a moment to complete the attendance tracker. I know um, Dave had dropped the attendance tracker into the chat. We've also dropped the session evaluation into the chat. I'm gonna drop right now the registration for the um, reading, reading, reading apprenticeship course. And so, and then we can go from there. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Let me grab that registration link for you. Mark, while you're doing that, there's a question in there about is there Northern Nevada opportunities from Kayla, I believe. Thank you, Kayla. Um, at this time, we there we finished out the Northern opportunities, but if you are interested, we probably could look at, um, we are having some additional webinars that will be offered later on in the fall. Uh, that will cover reading apprenticeship and disciplinary literacy. It will be a three-part series. Uh, that will be open statewide. Uh, again, individuals that attend will be able to obtain uh, professional learning hours from NDE. Uh, so that is a great opportunity to, to uh, participate in. And let me grab that link to the registration page. My apologies about getting the link out. There we go. Thank
Thank you so much, everyone, for bearing with me as I navigated six different windows on one monitor. So uh, I appreciate you being patient with me. And uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time just to spend uh, engaging with me in conversations about uh, your own personal experience when it came to literacy and uh, learning more about uh, disciplinary literacy. Um, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I will drop my email into the chat. Um, there are numer numerous opportunities that will be coming up. Like I mentioned, those three a three part series webinar on um, reading apprenticeship. And if you're based here in Southern Nevada, there will be that training opportunity. So again, I hope you enjoyed uh, this session at the conference and uh, I hope you, you enjoy the rest of your sessions as well. So have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Will you uh, shift me over as host?